a warm welcome to this fourth OCS refresher tutorial. Today, we're going to be having a look at the fog of war. There is a specific rule within OCS that deals with the fog of war, and we're not restricting ourselves to that at all. For me, the fog of war is a much broader concept. It starts with viewing the fog of war as a number of layers um, through which we have to peer uncertainly. uncertainly. Uh, OCS is not a game for people who like to just total up their combat strengths and find the appropriate column and roll the dice with a reasonable sense that they'll know what the outcome is going to be. In OCS, you get an operational layer that obscures how much you can plan. You get an intelligence layer, which is how much can you look down from our godlike heights and really understand what's happening on the battlefield. There's deception. What can your opponent be doing to upset your plans? Or indeed, slash, what can you be doing to disguise your intentions? There's the results. Who knows what they're going to be? And then finally, there's a number of things you can do to mitigate the level uncertainty. I view this in, in a number of layers. So at the top, there's the big stuff. How is this turn or set of turns that's going to be either an operation or a scenario? How's that realistically going to plan out? What can I realistically understand from, you know, just looking at the battlefield? What can I tell from the enemy's dispositions and what can I infer of their intentions? What results can I realistically expect? Um, given the high level uncertainty of what most of the die rolls are going to be producing, what can I do to confuse the enemy? And what can they do to confuse me by actively deceiving their deployments and their intentions? And what can be done to mitigate all of that? Right, let's look at the operational level first of all. So at the beginning of your turn, uh, our set of turns, the weather is usually going to have a big effect. Obviously, in some games, the weather is pretty even and universal, like DAC, where sandstorms and rainstorms very rarely happen, except to us, repeatedly in our last game. Anyhow, next up, first player determination. Who is going to have the initiative? OCS is an I might go, you might go game system. And the chance of manipulating that, the risk, of your opponent getting a double turn, a flip-flop, or the threat that you might force a flip-flop on your opponent is a proper Jedi mind game kind of experience. So really important, right at the very top of each turn, there are these things. And so weaker opponents feel that they you know, have to go second in order to deny the stronger player the opportunity to, to go twice. Your reinforcements, your replacements, your supply, this is very much game specific. Some games, this is very fixed. Other games, this can be very variable. Um, it could also obviously be very, one side gets an awful lot more reinforcements and supply than the other. Withdrawals equally tend to be game specific. They're usually fixed, but occasionally not. And what you might want to call maskerovka, the Russian idea of operational surprise made up of lots of many tactical deceptions. And I'm going to talk about those deceptions later on. But in the newer big East Front games, we're beginning to see things like the RGKV, the Strategic Reserve, suddenly appearing and for front barrages suddenly erupting across the, the whole front line. Yeah, not knowing what all of this is going to mean for your turn. Intelligence. So centrally, this is about stacking. If you haven't read it, you really ought to read OCS 101, Fog of War, Enemy Stacks by Chip Saltzman. You can find it in the OCS depot. It looks like this, and it talks about stacks and what you can, and just as importantly, what you can't do, what's illegal to do in a whole wealth of, <laughs> of detail. I'm just gonna you know, touch the very top of that by saying, your stacks have three mandatory top counters, your hedgehog of any level, an active aeroplane. If, it's a, if you have a fighter, that should be a fighter. So you can see the patrol zones and a combat mode attack capable unit. And if you haven't got a combat mode attack capable unit, 
than any combat unit, i.e. one that's in move mode. Note that reserves and strapped mode units aren't attack capable, so you can hide these underneath one that is. Optionally, you can also put your HQ on top if it's in the rear area and you need it to show your supply network um, e more easily, do do so. However, if the enemy starts to make any kind of moves towards it, then you must mention if there's a zone of control there, if there is a, a combat mode attack capable unit there. Otherwise, everything else is hidden. So here we go, a fighter, a combat unit, not in combat mode. Well, it is in combat mode, but it's not attack capable. And a hedgehog. These have to be seen, but all this rest can be hidden. The HQ could be on top if it's in the rear, but doesn't have to be if it's nearby. This is a attack capable unit, but it's in strap mode, so that doesn't count. This reserve mode marker is for this Panzer Division, and it's full of attack-capable units, but they're on reserve, so they are not attack-capable at this time, and so all can hide. And then the supply and inactive units and organic trucks and air bases, these, these are all invisible to the enemy. So there's a whole world of invisibility going on there. More widely, if we take this little screenshot from uh, our most recent GAC game that uh, was so much fun that we're going to carry it on in the autumn. So Barrage and Flax, you only have to tell people the Barrage strength and any mods, but you're not actually required to show the units. Okay, here is an artillery unit on top, but then it's probably hiding deliberately this cheeky unit underneath. Supply equally is hidden in the stack. The true strength of things don't have to be shown. So step losses or the use of internals or uh, the mode or status of units don't have to be on top. So long as if there is one with a zone of control, that is, but the other's not. Um, what the enemy is going to do with this uh, little reserve force, whatever this reserve force is, so that they can pop out, they can move, fill whole gaps, do overruns, do spoiling attacks, bring in uh, air attacks, the whole lot. And then finally, when your stack is going to have some combat, you only need to reveal the action rating and the total combat strength and whether there are any anti-tank effects. But neither side is actually required to show real combat units. There are some game-specific rules around this. So in case Blue and Guderian's Blitzkrieg and Smolensk, uh, NVKD troops are treated slightly differently, but you know, you'll see that in your individual games. But in totality, that's a whole world of hiding going on right there. Added to that, you or your opponent can do some wizard wheezes that will make life even harder. We already talked about reserves, when and how to release them. They are super central to the game, and I make no, no apology for banging on about them. You can disguise formation markers in reserve. You need to say if there are formation markers there, unless you're using this optional 13.7b, but you don't have to say what's in them. And so long as they're underneath a combat unit, that's absolutely fine. It can be a huge disguising thing. By the way, I'm not absolutely clear. Do you have to just say there's two Panzer Divisions or do you have to say, oh yes, it's the 21st and the 15th Panzer Divisions. Uh, I couldn't see anything specific. I'm assuming you just have to say that there are reserve marker, uh, formation markers there. But uh, if you know better, let me know. And of course, the strength of the formation marker is completely disguised. There needs to be one unit combat unit, one unit from the formation underneath or as part of that formation marker. You can't have an empty, but otherwise it doesn't have to contain the bulk of the formation at all. You can disguise the size of stacks by padding it. So for example, you could add one T to each frontline hex uh, to make the stack look taller. Um, that actually not only increases the fog of war, but actually gives units something to live on if they become encircled. 
and you can disguise your move mode units by putting them under a weaker unit, an anti-tank or an artillery or, or a rail repair unit. All of those are absolutely fine. In the rear areas, you can disguise your flak strength. So you could, for example, move up an HQ, not put it on the top. Uh, you could, in extreme, build up the, uh, the size of your airbase and not mention it to anybody so that when an air mission came along, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> there's a f HQ and a bigger airbase and a much bigger flak total as a consequence. You can disguise your extender to not make it clear where the limits of your expansion are, and of course, to protect the uh, extender. You can disguise modes such as disorganized strategic and reserve modes. Obviously, one of them has to be on top, if uh, assuming there aren't combat units uh, there, but otherwise, the others don't have to be. You can disguise fueled HQs by not putting them on top, and you can disguise bridging by nicking up with your HQ next to a river, and then next turn it's able to bridge that river. Finally, you can also disguise building up air attack forces. You fly them in, make them inactive, and then uh, create a large air force on that base. And then the next turn, you refit them all, and boom, suddenly there's a, an unexpected increase in strength in that area. The results, well, as we all know, the results are very variable and there are an awful lot of dice results. So air combat, I would say, is one of the more predictable of the uh, results table, including fighter sweeps. You, you might be intercepted unexpectedly. You might have just assumed that it was all going to go through. You, you didn't think somebody was going to take their plane off patrol and come and intercept you. The amount of flak might be unexpected, but otherwise I think air units aren't too bad. Barrage results, if you put enough strength into them, they do, and supply, they do become more predictable, but more expensive. Uh, so you're probably aiming to get a disorganized result. You may, if you're lucky, get a step loss, or you may, if you're unlucky, miss. You may also be trying to reduce bases, air bases, ports, etc or trying to get an interdiction results, they tend to be, all of that lot, a little bit harder. I mean, interdictions are often sort of like 50-50 or something. Surprise, the, oh my God, the hooray moment of great drama within the uh, within the game is uh, yeah wild if they occur, all bets are off as to what's gonna happen to them. But even without those, the combat results have a really large range of variability depending on your action rating and the terrain plus anti-tank effects, it's really unsettling and unknowable what the result's going to be until the dice stop rolling. And then finally, trying to capture things or blow things to avoid them being captured is annoying and disruptive, but equally pretty unknown. It, it could go a lot of different ways. So yes, the dice results in OCS are very variable. And then you have the option to make this worse or better. So you can agree that certain dice rolls can be in secret. Um, the rules suggest replacement rolls, for example. It's down to you guys. Formation markers, if you agree, can be hidden under a combat unit in a stack so that you don't have to say it's there but of course, if there's a zone of control in that formation, then that does affect things. There is this recon rule that you can decide to apply. Core of movements and one tier supply means that the total number of steps and the presence of heavy or light anti-tank has to be revealed to you. This is when you've moved adjacent to a stack. You can decide to increase the fog of war as if it wasn't thick enough already. Um, so that you're only allowed to see the top attack capable unit in a stack if you're adjacent to it. So that makes only two mandatories, the hedgehog level and an active plane, particularly a fighter if there is one, and you only get to see an attack capable unit if you are adjacent to the stack. 
you could agree to decrease the fog of war and just put the planes to one side because stacks can get pretty big with air bases and lots of, uh, you know, four, five, six airplanes on it. I think a lot of people use that. And of course, you can just decide to play much more in the open. Um, OCS is a difficult game. It's super easy to unintentionally go wrong. And just helping your friend who you're playing keep you honest and counting things and making sure you haven't missed anything or a hex site there because it's obscured by the stack or whatever is can be super helpful and absolutely vital if you are teaching the game uh, to somebody. Mitigating. Okay. So th the biggest thing probably is not to just hurtle forward with the game going attack, 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 or defend, defend, defend. Have some sort of plan B. Think about how am I going to use my reserves? Are they there to fill a hole in the line if my opponent gets a breakthrough? Are they there if the breakthrough doesn't happen, my breakthrough, and I want to have a second go at seeing if I can penetrate the line? Are they there because the grandiose exploit that I wanted to do didn't come off, and so I'll release some reserves and see what they can do? Really consciously think about your reserves. Think also about before you do your attacks and what have you, when do I stop attacking? You know, it's easy to start. Can I afford to fail in this attack? Am I actually going to cause a breach in my own line if I take some losses here? Will the success of this attack will it really matter? Is it really going to take a difference? And am I actually getting close or have I exhausted my supply at this point and I really need to reconsider and stop? Equally, before you get uh, too het up with everything, is plan around do I need to fall back? Would it help if I shortened my line? Would I, or if I went back to better terrain or the reverse of that? Would I lengthen my line and stretch him out a bit more because I've got a, a lot of units, but they're very weak? Equally important is the emotional side of the game. So try and avoid getting full of all of those dice emotions. Now, I know some of you are, you know, closely related to Mr. Spock, uh, were academically trained in engineering or the hard sciences. And for you, getting emotional about the dice would never, ever happen. But for the rest of us, we're prone to a lot of the cognitive biases and emotional daft thoughts that surround the dice and why they sometimes get thrown out of windows. So I've listed just a few here. There are many of them. The sunk cost fallacy. I've invested so much in trying to take Jeruk other place. I must carry on. Really? Go back to plan to stop attacking. The hot hand fallacy. My dice are hot. I can't lose. Or I'm, or, or it's chilly reverse. Uh, I always throw rubbish uh, and, and, you know, not be surprised. And what you get with these things is a certain confirmation bias. Uh, if you think you're bad at dice and you get a bad dice, that's just going to completely confirm everything you've ever thought about these rubbish dice. Uh, the absurdity heuristic, heuristics are rules of thumb. Um, so if something is unlikely to happen, we are very prone to making it an absurdity. My gaming group has a little pageant. You throw snake eyes and you are allowed to claim to the ceiling, what are the chances of that? To which the chorus is one in a million. Well, no, actually it's one in 36, but it just feels like you should never get double ones. Stiffen units. I wanted to say combine, or uh, but I, that means something else. So don't leave single units around the place. They are just magnets. You may feel that your high five AR strength single unit is almost invincible, but it's so not, particularly if it's in move mode. But even when it isn't, it's very vulnerable. Make sure that you don't leave low hanging fruit for your opponent to come and hoover up. And finally, a bit of fortitude, a bit of zen. Stiff up a lip, as we would say in Britain, or man up, or just cheer up. My friend Heinrich said, 
losing in OCS is a lot more fun than winning in many other games. And so if it's not going your way, either because you're on the weaker losing force and you're being kicked around the map, or because you should have been the one that is demonstrating their triumph of the will and smashing it and your attacks have all gone wrong, it's fine. You're still having fun. It's a narrative experience. It's not a I win, you lose experience playing OCS. Legal intelligence. What can you legally know about your opponent? So obviously we've already discussed this, what's on the top of the stack things. That's fine. You can do little things like barrage intelligence. So you can use an air unit or an artillery barrage. Air units are obviously um, less expensive in supply to make a barrage and find out the density shift mod that's applied. So you get a rough number of REs. That's very telling. You know, there's this super stack that you want to attack and you do a little barrage and your opponent says, oh no, there's no mods. What? This super stack and it doesn't have more than three REs. Hmm, interesting. There's this recon rule that we've already discussed. It's a bit of an edge case. But when you need it, when you want it, again, knowing the total number of steps and how much armor and anti-tank is in that stack is pretty useful because this is likely to be a major attack with big consequences, whether you win or lose. You can do aerial reconnaissance, look at the, at the stack from the side. That's fine. Just, you know, don't be a jerk about it. And of course, you can use your open source intelligence. You can just ask your opponents as you come round with that round of drinks and hand him his pint of beer. How's it going? Is this da 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 da? And just see if they're just going to blurt out all, all of their cunning plans to you. When it comes to all those interactions that require a dice, play the odds. The rule of seven is super useful. So here's how the dice can go. Here's the fraction of any one number uh, appearing. Here's the corresponding percentage. But what we are usually interested in is the cumulative number. I need seven or above. So I have a 21 to 36 chance, or more easy to say 58% chance of getting a seven or more. And you can see I've colored these, you know, dark green for 100% things where there's no uncertainty and green where you're more likely to succeed than to fail and the reds where you're more likely to fail than succeed. And asking yourself the rule of seven kind of number, what's the most likely result here, I think is a really powerful corrective for you get a bit giddy and, and just, you know, <laughs> want to attack because you've been attacking and all the other attacks have been successful and you've got hot hands. No, you haven't. My feeling on this is that if you're dealing with a 91% chance, that's surely a, <laughs> a sure thing. <laughs> What's the chances of it not happening? Pretty safe at 80. At 72%, it should be. Notice that kind of moralistic language, like the dice <laughs> has any understanding of what should or should not be. The rule of seven itself. Then you're getting into chancy uh, results and whether you're, you know, 27%, you know, less than the third chance. I mean, that's pushing it. And honestly, 16%, you're, you're just being cheeky and wanting a bit of luck to get something at that level. This, of course, is on a flat, even field. Here's that same number here. But notice the primacy of the mods, particularly action rating and particularly terrain. So as you get one two and three mods four, you will notice that the what was the rule of seven result here goes down and down and down. So by plus three, a 10 or more is the same as a seven or more uh, without those mods. And you can see the green certainty area and the light green hopeful area increasing correspondingly has a, has a vast impact on the likely success of any thing. So from 58%, at no mods to 91%. If you want to take this to the next level, Chris Dodd has done this uh, 
formidable piece of analysis of all the different combat results variations depending upon what kind of hedgehog you're in and what kind of action rating differential you are working with so you know knock yourself out there's some wonderful maths in all of that finally these levels of uncertainty don't exist in a vacuum they have short-term impacts. By short-term, I mean two to three turns, a little oper either a small scenario or a little operation you're trying to do to break into Chabruk or whatever. And then long-term, the whole campaign. So things like the weather can have a massive short-term impact, particularly if it delays an operation. But over the um, great length of campaign, it, it probably all evens out and has a small impact, unless you've got one of these evil mud seasons which go on for too long. First player determination, who has the initiative, again, has this enormous impact on any short-term play for the ability to get a double turn. If you do get a double turn, you get six phases and your enemy gets two. So there are four phases in a turn. Three of them are yours, movement, uh, combat, and exploitation. And one is your opponent's reaction. So if you get two turns, you get six of those and your opponent only gets two reactions, whereas normally, over two turns, you would have had four, and they would have had four. Again, this probably evens out over time. How the enemy, or indeed how you, are using your reserves to react, if they react well, that can have a massive impact, but again, ought to, ought to even out over time. Supply for short-term operations shouldn't matter that much unless you're absolutely operating on a shoestring and every token matters. But over a campaign, it can have a massive impact. It will tend to even out in terms of the dice roll, but of course the supply tables can be very, very different beasts. Equally the same for replacements. Not much impact in the short term, big impact in the campaign. And the operational level of the game, your big meta planning, where am I attacking? Am I going to the north or to the south or to the east or whatever? Where am I putting my reinforcements when my reinforcements have choices? This map edge, that map edge. In the short term, not much impact, but huge uh, over the course of the campaign. And although they don't necessarily feel like big decisions when you play them, uh, if you play them with a certain plan and coherence, they can have this massive effect. Intelligence can have a big impact in the short term if your enemy is able to use deception to create surprise, or indeed if you are. Probably evens out in the long term, except for those, you know, if only moments. If only I had realized that your stack in the middle of your book was this thing and my attack didn't completely fail it would all have been so different and ditto around the kind of the dice the tactical results you're going to get short term huge impact long term really around those uh, if only moments or as uh, we like to say in my gaming group not all dice rolls matter the same so i hope that's been interesting to you up next, I'm going to be doing a, another my Rule of Wave series for my naval enthusiasts. But for you of more interest, I'm going to be scripting out the fifth in this OCS refresher course. I'm thinking that's going to be about how do you exploit the sequence of play and how do you exploit combinations of different units to get the very best results. I'm tentatively calling it uh, orchestration. I'm also this will take a while. These scripts, as you can imagine, take a while to put together. I'm also putting together a little new website so that these presentations can be downloaded. Uh, Wardrobe, who has a uh, great YouTube channel himself, asked me, um, are you going to um, make these available? I said, yeah, I'll probably do it tomorrow. <laughs> Months later, sorry, Wardrobe, I will get round to it. And finally, huge, huge... Thanks to Heinrich Hoof, who went th with me through several script revisions, and we had some uh, a nice video chat about the whole thing, and we all got OCS nerdy together, and it was lovely. To Tip Saltzman, who worked so hard on the uh, stacking Fog of War, 
and to my friends John and Steve for uh, supporting me in all of this. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.